Good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all here on a steamy Friday night in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, just reminding you to please turn off or silence your cell phones. Uh, I'm so pleased to be introducing our speaker tonight. Um, this is our third lecture um, in the series uh, celebrating the special exhibition from the lands of Asia. Uh, the Sam and Myrna Myers collection. Um, this has been a great opportunity for me to bring in a lot of my friends to come and speak on various uh, themes that are presented in the exhibition. And our final talk will be on July 13th, and that is with J. Keith Wilson from the Freer Sackler in Washington, D.C., and he will be speaking about ancient Chinese jades. But tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome a longtime colleague and friend, uh, Philip K. Hu, who is the curator of Asian art at the St. Louis Art Museum. A native of Singapore, Philip received his BA in architecture from UC Berkeley, a master of architecture from UCLA, and an MA in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. As a PhD candidate in Chinese art history at the Institute, as we call it, that's where Philip and I met, he taught East Asian art history at the Department of Fine Arts at New York University and at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's received research fellowships from Dumbarton Oaks Research Library and Collection, the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, Smithsonian Institution, and the Wolfsonian Florida International University. Since joining the St. Louis Art Museum in 2006, Philip has reinstalled the galleries for ancient Chinese jades, bronzes, and ceramics, Chinese and Japanese export porcelains, and Korean, Japanese, Southeast, South Asian, and Himalayan art. He has curated peri periodic rotations of East Asian art on paper and silk, as well as the special exhibitions, Power and Glory, Court Arts of China's Ming Dynasty, Five Centuries of Japanese Screens, Masterpieces from the St. Louis Art Museum and the Art Institute of Chicago. And in 2016, Master, um, I'm sorry, Conflicts of Interest, Art and War in Modern Japan, for which he was editor and chief author of the catalog. He's also, also author of Visible Traces, Rare Books and Special Collections from the National Library of China and later Chinese bronzes, the St. Louis Art Museum, and Robert E. Cresco collections. In his lecture tonight, entitled Chinese Porcelain, Impact, Influence, and Importance Beyond the Middle Kingdom, Philip will discuss how Chinese porcelain made its way to many parts of the world, largely through maritime trade routes spanning East Asia, Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, Persia, and the Ottoman Empire. Selected highlights from the Sam and Myrna Myers collection illustrate how the shapes and decoration of such Chinese porcelains were often inspired by non-ceramic prototypes and specifically tailored to the varying tastes of foreign markets. So would you please join me in welcoming Philip Hu. Good evening, everyone. Smile. Yes, I'm one of those. <laughs> Jennifer knows me well. <laughs> Anyways, I'm delighted to be here um, in Fort Worth, Texas. And it is very, very hot. But I think I've proven my mettle, because after I arrived here yesterday and it was 98 degrees, I still spent five hours at the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens and survived to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful garden, by the way, and I, you guys are very lucky to have such a wonderful uh, nature uh, and beautiful uh, green area in, in your midst. So for tonight, um, I'm pleased to talk to you about uh, some aspect of Chinese porcelain. Um, I realized as I was writing the talk that if I talked about everything there is to talk about Chinese porcelain, you guys would be here for at least eight hours. <laughs> So that's not going to happen. Uh, we'll focus on some uh, very specific topics uh, in the history of Chinese porcelain, 
And what I'd like to do is to uh, just tell you some stories uh, which I think are important for anyone to know about if they're interested in learning more about the history of Chinese porcelain, particularly blue and white porcelain. I also have to say that I'm limiting tonight's talk to blue and white because there are many, many other types of porcelain uh, that we could talk about, and you would be here for days if we um, did the rest. Okay, so let me begin tonight. Uh, first of all, thanks, Jennifer, and thank you for installing such a wonderful exhibition, which I just went through. Um, I have to say, it's very difficult to install a show of so many different kinds of things, because you have to make them all look good. And Jennifer, you did a great job, so. <laughs> So um, first of all, thank you. So I thought what I'd do to begin the lecture is to focus on the color blue, because when we talk about blue and white porcelain, um, that is one of the things that we should be looking out for. And we don't often do that. Uh, we just think of blue as blue. But blue as a color, as you can see on the screen, is not just one kind of blue. There are many, many different shades of blue. As I was studying this, I was quite surprised to learn about some things that don't look very blue that are also called blue. Uh, there are some sort of rather pale, white-looking white colors called, like, for example, Marian blue, a blue that is used to, to depict the Virgin Mary. It's a very, very pale kind of blue, but now I know that there is a color called Marian blue. Um, but I think if you look across the screen, if you squint a little and you can read the, the areas that um, are labeled, you might spot Persian blue. Can someone see where Persian blue is? Um, that's Persian blue, yes, okay. So that's an important color for us to bear in mind for tonight's lecture. Um, let me see, there's also, um, cobalt blue up here, okay? So these are two colors I'd like you to kind of bear in mind. Um, in Chinese blue and white porcelain, uh, when we talk about the development of the porcelain through historical periods, uh, there are generally several phases that ceramic historians will break this period up to. Uh, blue and white first appeared um, in Chinese porcelain in the Yuan Dynasty. Uh, that's the first uh, dynasty up here on the top from 1279 to 1368. It's important to remember that this was a Mongol dynasty of China. So the, the rulers were non-Chinese and that the, Mo the Yuan Dynasty, the empire of China during this time was actually part of a much larger Islamic world that was divided into four different caliphates and the Yuan, the Mongols in China, was one of those four caliphates. Uh, second phase uh, is generally what we would call early Ming Dynasty porcelain. So from the founding reign of the Hongwu, the first emperor, uh, and the second, the Yongle, uh, and then moving into the third uh, phase. Uh, sometimes Xuanda uh, is lumped into the first phase, but uh, it, to the second phase, but it actually should belong in technical terms to the third phase. Uh, Xuanda through Hongzhi, so 1426 to 1505. And then finally, in the late Ming Dynasty, we have the Zhengde through the Chongzhen, the final reigns of 1644. Um, in ch the history of Chinese uh, porcelain, the use of blue and native cobalt, uh, cobalt that's imported to China, as well as cobalt that was found in China, um, can, can be found throughout its history. So people who have studied uh, these uh, in, in very uh, careful terms have found that during the Yuan and early Ming, in the early part of the history of blue and white, cobalt was generally imported from abroad. So in addition to um, the ones that come from Persia, we have what is known as Samara blue, uh, which comes mostly from Iraq, and Sumatra blue, which comes from Sumatra. Uh, in Indonesia today. And during the Ming, a middle part of the Ming Dynasty, a different kind of cobalt was used. That's cobalt that was primarily produced in, within the empire of China itself. And this is what is called Shiqing, or mineral blue. And then finally, in the last part of uh, the Ming Dynasty, you have a combination of the use of both imported 
uh, cobalt and the use of native cobalts in porcelain. So when you look at these objects in the exhibition, uh, try to look very carefully at the colors of the blue, because they're not just one kind of blue. And even within a single piece, you will often find lighter and darker shades of blue, uh, blue that might uh, tend towards even violet or purple, uh, and blue that is very, very light in color. So you know, there is a rich range of blue uh, to look for in the show. But what I wanted to also show you is how this material came about uh, to be used on porcelain. Uh, I don't think many people have actually seen raw cobalt. How many people here have seen raw cobalt? I don't think anyone has, and I certainly haven't, but I went and did some research because I wanted to know what raw cobalt looks like. And here we have the ore on the left, uh, two examples of how it would be found in nature. Um, cobalt ore actually comes from a mineral known as cobaltite, which is a combination of cobalt arsenic sulfide. Okay, so for th those of you in chemistry, you'll love this, these uh, names. Um, but it's a sulfide mineral, and it may contain up to about 10% of uh, iron, uh, sometimes a little bit of nickel as well. Uh, so it's not a pure mineral. So it's a, a composite mineral. And the cobalt that we uh, find in early uh, Chinese porcelain came from largely from Persia, uh, from this area uh, in Isfahan uh, province in, in, as the, around the city of Kashan. Kashan is also uh, famously known for its traditional uh, Persian type pottery. Uh, you'll, you'll see on many labels, Kashan ware or Kashan pottery. And the reason why uh, Kashan pottery was made in that area is because cobalt was available nearby. And therefore, the Persians also used cobalt to decorate their ceramics in beautiful shades of blue. So the geography um, has a lot to do with everything here. Um, here on the right, you see images of that area in, in uh, the Kashan area. Uh, the, the mines uh, where cobaltite is actually found is a little further south of the city of Kashan in a place called Kamza, uh, about 15 uh, kilometers to the south or southwest. And this is the kind of terrain uh, out of which the uh, mineral ore for cobalt would be mined. So you can see that these are you know, rough and inhospitable situations where this precious material would be harvested uh, for the use uh, in decoration of porcelain uh, and uh, other uh, kinds of art. Here's another view uh, showing the location of Kamzar and the kinds of uh, mountains that you would find a cobaltite in. Um, a geological map here uh, that shows you with a blue star uh, being the location of Kamzar and, and Kashan. And again, the kinds of um, kind of gray metallic uh, ore that is mined uh, to produce cobalt. Now, cobalt itself, um, the chemical uh, element cobalt, has to be extracted from the, the ore. Uh, cobalt uh, CO for short, uh, actually CO27 CO, <laughs> very complicated formula. Um, it's actually turned into cobalt oxide. The stuff that was used to paint um, this color on Chinese porcelain actually doesn't look blue at all, uh, even when it's prepared. So what you see here is cobalt oxide that is derived from the metallic uh, ore of, of cobaltite. And I just threw this in because I thought it's a really cool diagram of what these little elements look like in, in these minute particles. Um, but they're also to draw the difference um, between cobalt oxide that is used for the painting of porcelain uh, and what it was later invented in about the 18th century in Europe, uh, cobalt blue pigment. Cobalt blue pigment, which you often see in paintings by uh, Veronese and by Titian um, and other uh, European painters, um, uh, this kind of blue is derived from the pigment cobalt blue, which is actually produced chemically by sintering the cobalt oxide with alumina at a very high temperature. So this is an artificially created um, oxide, whereas cobalt, blue, uh, cobalt that's mined from the ore 
is actually still a natural element. So that's the differentiation of cobalt pigment uh, and cobalt oxide. So I want to show you some examples of um, the kinds of pottery that were made in Persia using those kinds of cobalt oxide from the area of Kashan. So these are all um, uh, examples from the St. Louis Art Museum. It was easy for me to get these pictures. But you can see um, that in this particular bowl, you have uh, both blue and green uh, pigment, uh, color used against a white background. It's important to bear in mind that the, these uh, examples here are not porcelain. They're called fritware. Okay? Fritware basically is a stone paste um, that actually has a lot of glass in it. So it shatters very, very easily. And that's why it's almost impossible for any museum to find an Islamic bowl or dish that is completely intact. Most of them are broken and have to be fixed back again because they're very, very fragile. Uh, this kind of fritware looks beautiful um, and looks like porcelain, but it is not porcelain. Uh, same here. Uh, this is an example also from the Seljuk period of, of Persia. Um, you can see the piercing of the, the, uh, the body of the fritware and then the blue glazed uh, covering those areas. Um, very beautiful, but very fragile and also not porcelain. And uh, finally, another example uh, using cobalt blue uh, on a kind of white fritware. Uh, this one also has calligraphic inscriptions on it. So the, the Chinese were aware of what the Persians were doing with their ceramics and very much wanted to be able to do that with their own porcelain as well. So the Chinese, uh, during the Yuan Dynasty, during this Mongol period, decided that they would import this raw cobalt oxide from Persia. And that's a long ways off from China. So how was it done? Right? It had to be brought to China somehow. But here are some examples, first of all, to show you um, uh, in contemporary Chinese porcelain decoration, the application of cobalt oxide onto a porcelain body before it is covered with glaze and before it is fired in the kiln. So you can see that the color looks like this sort of dark gray color when it is first painted on the porcelain. How does it become blue later on? It becomes blue through the process of the application of the glaze, which has certain amounts of silica and alumina in it, and sometimes iron as well. And when the porcelain is then fired at about 1400 degrees centigrade, all of those chemicals fuse together and it's that sintering process again, the combination of the cobalt oxide with these other elements in the glaze mixture changes it into blue. So it's actually a kind of magic, almost magical alchemical formula that the Chinese discovered were able to apply to the design of Chinese porcelains. So here we see on the screen probably the most famous example of Yuan Dynasty porcelain in the world. And this pair of um, altar vases uh, are in the Percival David Foundation collection of Chinese art. And you can see them today. Uh, they're on long-term loan to the British Museum uh, in a gallery devoted to the, the David collection. These pair of vases um, are very, very important, not only because they're monumental and beautiful, but primarily because they're inscribed and dated. So the inscriptions uh, up in the uh, section here give the exact date of production of this, uh, these uh, two vases to the year 1351. Okay, that's smack in the middle of the 14th century, and that's during the later part of the Yuan Dynasty. So we know that by 1351, the Chinese had already perfected the application of cobalt oxide onto a porcelain body to produce what we now call blue and white porcelain. But of course, if, if by 1351 you could have done this, you me that means that they probably could have done it slightly earlier as well. It's just that those objects are not dated. So 
Hollywood. So probably by the 1330s or 40s, uh, blue and white uh, was already perfected in China. So bear, bear these two pieces in mind. They're very important. And go, please go see them on your next trip in London. So again, the question um, we want to find out is, well, how was this cobalt brought to China all the way from Persia? Well, there are two main ways that they came. Uh, they came both through the overland Silk Road, which of course connects um, Chang'an, uh, the main uh, old uh, Tang, Han and Tang capital over here, to the uh, east coast of the Mediterranean, uh, which is now in Syria. So Palmyra and uh, other cities uh, in Syria were connected through this main Silk Road, which also had you know, northern and southern branches through uh, the, the center portion. So from Iran, uh, you can see that Kashan is right sort of a little bit north of the Silk Road. So all that mined cobalt oxa, uh, ore had to be brought to the actual Silk Road location and then put on camels and other kinds of um, uh, animals to be uh, brought all this way into China. And then from here, it still had to be transported to the center of Chinese uh, ceramic production, which is sort of down here. Uh, Jingdezhen, the, uh, the main center for Chinese porcelain, uh, imperial porcelain kilns, is far off in the eastern part of China. So you can see how long and arduous this road is, but the Chinese desired uh, this cobalt so much because of that magical uh, way it could transform into this beautiful blue on a pure white porcelain base. Now the uh, second way that the, um, the cobalt was transported to, uh, from Persia to China is through the maritime trade routes. Uh, this, plant, this actually shows some of the later routes used for porcelain uh, between 1600 and 1850. Uh, but you get the scent, uh, and earlier, there were much earlier uh, route maps as well, which I just didn't happen to have on hand. But you can see that the path is usually from, uh, at least from China going out, it's through the South China Sea, and then through the Indian Ocean, and then through the Persian Gulf, and then going to Europe is through the Cape of Good Hope. But, of course, um, the trade travels in both ways, so that the, the Persian cobalt that was mined not far from the Caspian Sea here would also have been brought then to um, a port um, in the Persian Gulf and then shipped this direction to China and further up. And here you do see the location of Jingdezhen on the map. This is the porcelain capital of China. So no matter which way, it's still a long and arduous trip. And ships often, of course, sunk uh, during their travels. And as you can see in the exhibition, many times uh, the, the cargo went down. And sometimes they were found, and sometimes they aren't found. So and the cobalt, of course, if it disappears, good luck to trying to re retrieve your cobalt. Um, OK, so what I also wanted to show you tonight is how um, and why um, Chinese porcelain, which had already been made and perfected in China by the middle of the 14th century, why and where they ended up outside of China. So for tonight's lecture, I just want to focus on two of the most important collections, early, early collections of Chinese porcelain in places that you might not imagine that they would ever go to. But there they are. The first one uh, is in present-day Iran. Um, of course, in the old days, it was called Persia. Um, and in a place called Ardabil. Ardabil is both the name of a a present-day province, but it's also the name of a city. Um, so let's go there. Uh, in Ardabil, uh, we have this magnificent monument called the Mausoleum of Sheikh Safi al-Din Ardabil. Um, this was built um, between the uh, beginning of the 16th uh, and all the way through the 18th century uh, as a monument to the Sufi spiritual leader, uh, Sheikh Safi. So um, it's an important uh, location in Iran. And since 2010 
has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, that, that gives you a sense of how important it is to world culture at large. So the, um, the buildings, which is a complex of um, courtyards and uh, architectural spaces, uh, here you can see a plan of it on the left. Um, you would enter through here into this sort of open courtyard with plantings, and then through a second kind of small courtyard, and then into a third large courtyard here. Uh, and that is the space that you see in these two pictures, is this large space. And this big door here, this big door, is this big door over here. So in this complex, we have uh, a series of large ceremonial spaces, a kind of mosque-like uh, gathering space, and also a, um, uh, a tomb a location uh, for the Sufi saint. Um, but what concerns us most is this structure at the very top of the complex. Um, that structure is known as the Kanaga, which uh, translate as porcelain house. And that was especially built um, to house the collection of Chinese porcelain um, at this shrine. So how did it happen that this shrine in northern Iran, not even in the capital of the country, got this amazing collection of porcelain? Well, it turns out that um, Shah Abbas the Great, who is also known as Shah Abbas I of Persia, uh, who was the fifth uh, Safavid uh, Shah of Iran, donated a large collection of porcelain to the shrine um, in the year 1611. Um, did I put that somewhere? Uh, let's see, I can't see. Anyways, um, the, the Shah, of course, had been collecting, had been given uh, many, many pieces of Chinese porcelain by the Chinese, uh, both um, as tribute items or, or things that he had personally ordered uh, from the Chinese kilns. And so he had slowly built up this very, very large collection. Um, the, the collection was, did not come in at one time, but it was continually built uh, from the Yuan into the Ming Dynasty. So by the time 1611 rolled around, that was uh, kind of middle of the Ming Dynasty, um, he had amassed this giant collection uh, of more than a thousand pieces of Chinese porcelain, which he then piously donated uh, to this shrine in Ardabil. Um, this was not his only act of philanthropy. Uh, he actually gave away most of his personal possessions, small and large, uh, during a number of years, around the year 1611, as an act of piety, um, you know, as an act of um, letting go of his worldly possessions and giving them to places where they could be used and appreciated. And so here we see portraits of um, Shah Abbas, uh, depicted by European artists. He's such a, a major figure that you see him uh, depicted in, in European prints and books and, and drawings as well. Um, and here's a picture from the late 19th century showing some of those Chinese porcelains in situ uh, in that porcelain house at the shrine. So by the, when this picture was taken, they were still there. Um, uh, but many of them actually had been taken away already by the late 19th century because of this treaty in 1828 that was signed between Russia uh, and Persia uh, in order to settle uh, a war between those two countries. Um, many of the Ardabil porcelains were removed by the Russians to St. Petersburg. Unfortunately, those porcelains are not very well known or published. Um, they're probably still there. There's a lot of stuff from other countries in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Um, you know how all those paintings from Berlin were taken to St. Petersburg? Same sort of thing happened here. So they, someday we hope that the Hermitage will publish its collection of the Artabil porcelains because they're very, very important for the study of Chinese porcelains. Um, okay, so I want to draw your attention to this scholar and to this publication. John Alexander Pope 
was the um, one-time director of the Freer Gallery of Art of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And he was a specialist of Chinese porcelain, and he was able to publish in 1956 this very, very seminal publication called Chinese Porcelains from the Artable Shrine. Uh, the book is out of print today, um, but if you do have a copy of this, it's worth a lot. <laughs> so hang on to it. Don't, don't recycle it. Uh, somebody will want it. Um, um, in any case, by the time Pope came around to study and writing this catalog, only 805 pieces remained in the Artable Shrine itself. The rest had been taken away. So uh, we don't know what uh, the rest looks like now. But out of this 805, um, more than three quarters were blue and white porcelains. Uh, the others being either celadon, sort of greenish type porcelains, or plain white porcelains without any blue decoration on them. Um, so the, you can see that the proportion of blue and white is very, very large um, in, this, in this collection, which shows how much the Persians appreciated this uh, blue and white coming all the way from China. Uh, perhaps it's because they also appreciated the fact that the cobalt that was used came from their own country, and therefore it made it even more special for them to have them produced and brought back to, to their country of origin. Now, if you go to Artabil today, um, you won't see all of those 805 pieces that are described in this catalog um, in, in, in 1956. Uh, sometime after that time, um, many of those pieces were actually brought to Tehran to the National Museum, uh, the, uh, the National uh, Bastan Museum uh, in Tehran, um, and then displayed there. But some of those pieces in recent years have actually been returned to Ardabil. So you could see some of them there, but probably not the best pieces. And this, these are some images from that museum in Tehran, um, where the best examples of the Ardabil porcelains are shown. So for example, here you see some Japanese dignitaries visiting, looking at uh, the blue and white, uh, the Yuan piece and the Ming pieces. This is a, a Yuan blue and white maping, a Prunus vase, and this Ming globular uh, vase is the same one that was on the cover of the Pope catalog. So all of these are in Tehran today. So please visit and see it if you have a chance to go there. The museum itself is actually a, um, an addition, a new building to the old uh, National Museum campus. So you can see it's a modern facility. Um, and part of that collection has also been published the ones that went to Iran, uh, to the National Museum of, of Bastan, uh, published in one of the volumes of this set of books, published um, in Tokyo in 1978. Also a very important collection. I'm sure the Freer Library has a whole, s uh, the Kimball Library has a whole set here. Um, but these are examples of some of the Chinese porcelains that you can now see at the Artable Shrine. These are the ones that have been returned from Tehran uh, to Artabil. Um, it's a bit of a cacophony because the blue and white is already so incredibly decorated and they're set against this also incredibly decorated background of Persian tiles. So this is not the best exhibition strategy, but, but you get the idea. Maybe more is more. Um, but it's nice to see black and uh, blue and white against just a plain white background, right? You don't want all this distraction. So that's why Jennifer's installation here is so beautiful. And <laughs> so appreciate it. Um, but anyways, you can see these uh, in, in, in Artabil if you ever have a chance to visit there. Um, here is one of those examples uh, from um, the Artabil shrine that actually for, in some capacity left Iran and is now in the VNA in London. But we know that it was in the Artable Shrine because of inscriptions um, on the back of the piece. So things come and go, right? Uh, porcelain, even though it's so fragile, actually can travel great distances and actually remain in perfect condition 
if the shipping conditions are ideal. And apparently this happened uh, in this case of this uh, foliated rim dish from the Ming. This is an early Ming example uh, of this kind of uh, dish that has a bracket rim. You, will, you, you, you might ask, well, why this kind of decoration, a shape? Um, if you are a potter, you'll know that that's not really a very natural shape when you're throwing a pot, right, or a dish. It tends to be round. That's a natural shape when you're doing it on a wheel. These kinds of porcelains are actually based on metal ware examples. Um, it's much easier to cast uh, a metal piece with fancy, fancy uh, edges than it is to, to throw a pot. But here, the potters in China have perfected uh, imitating a metalware shape. And this is Islamic metalware shape. So that shape definitely appealed back to the customers uh, who ordered these things in, uh, in Persia and other um, Islamic countries. The decoration um, is of floral motifs, again, um, perfect for the Islamic world uh, because um, of the prescriptions of uh, showing uh, human imagery, but flowers and plants are perfectly okay. Um, here, I want to contrast the, um, the V&A piece, which is on the left, which was once in the Artable Shrine, with another example, almost identical, that's now in the British Museum, also in London. So you can see how um, the same idea of decoration can be repeated almost infinitely with very minor um, changes. Obviously, the two are not exactly the same, and they could never be exactly the same because they were painted by hand. Um, so no two dishes could ever be perfectly identical. And if you did find that one was perfectly identical, something's wrong with it. It might be very new. Um, um, and then I want to contrast again um, this uh, Artabil piece that's now in the VNA with another example in the VNA um, uh, showing this kind of uh, round dish, but this is an imitation Chinese porcelain. This was made by potters that were originally from Damascus that were actually sort of brought to Sarakant uh, at some point in time. Uh, by the uh, Timur, the conqueror, and they were made in Samarkand, but copying Chinese porcelain. So you can see how interesting it is. The cobalt goes to China, the porcelain that's made in China comes back to <laughs> Persia, and then they themselves make imitation examples of what the Chinese produced. So the history of blue and white is fascinating because it grows and grows into these uh, different stories that one could tell forever. Uh, the second of a very, very important location for the history of Chinese porcelain is the Topkapi Palace Museum, Topkapi, Topkapi Sare Museum in Istanbul, Turkey. How many of you have been there? Yes, more people. I think that's not so hard to get to. Istanbul is, is an easy travel destination. Um, but if you have not been there or are you going to go again to the Topkapi, please make sure that you go and see the Chinese porcelain collection because it is also incredible. It is the largest collection of Chinese ceramics outside of China, anywhere. So there are more than 10,000 pieces in this collection. Here is a historical photograph showing the installation of part of that collection in the Topkapi Sare Museum. Um, again, the large proportion of these are blue and white. Again, blue and white also very much appealed to the sultans um, in Istanbul by the time uh, they arrived. Um, and again, many examples of Yuan dynasty, uh, 40 pieces, which is a lot for one collection, um, and then almost 50 early Ming pieces, which is also a very uh, large number uh, for any museum to possess. Uh, this collection is much more well known. It's been fully catalogued and fully published in this set of three books um, uh, by Regina Kral uh, and some other scholars. Um, and again, 
a, a precious resource for those of us who aren't able to travel that far. Um, everything is published beautifully in full color um, and described carefully. So I would recommend if you're studying and wanting to know more about Chinese porcelain, this is a very good resource. So the Topkapi collection has an extraordinary collection of Yuan porcelain, this earliest phase of blue and white. Um, here you can see some of the, the most important examples in that collection. Um, all of these, if they were back in China today, would probably be classed as national treasures. Um, these are designs that were specially made for the Islamic market. You don't find this kind of decoration in imperial Chinese porcelain made for the emperors themselves in China. This is definitely catering to a foreign taste. Um, you can see how tight the decoration is. Everything is crammed together uh, into a small space um, um, that contrasts more with later porcelains, which have more of the white against which the blue is, is decorated. But in this early Yuan phase, it was very common for the porcelain to be almost completely decorated in the cobalt blue. And the blue is very rich at this time. At this time, all of the cobalt that was used was probably the ones that were imported from Persia. It gives you a very, very deep, rich blue. But even so, there are variations of the blue even within certain pieces. Um, again, um, just want to show you, um, to remind you again, that the blue and white uh, comes out of uh, this old uh, 12th, 13th century Persian blue. So by the 14th century, the Chinese have mastered it. So I'm going to skip through this quickly. Okay, one of the um, great examples in this particular exhibition is this uh, Mei Ping. Uh, which is actually a prunus vase. Prunus, uh, the name of the vase is called prunus vase because it was believed that it would be suitable for putting a big sprig of prunus blossom uh, into the small mouth and that it would hold and not topple over. But in reality, that's probably not the case. These were containers for wine. And very often, they actually had covers on them as well, matching covers. Most of the time when we look at Yuan and early Ming Mei Ping, uh, most of the covers have been lost. It's very, very rare to see the cover with the vase itself. So uh, nonetheless, this is a very interesting example from the Myers collection uh, because it shows you the way um, the decoration is divided into horizontal registers. Um, and what I wanted to show you is that this kind of decoration actually comes out of another kind of Jap uh, Chinese porcelain decoration. Uh, Qingbai porcelain, which you have some examples in the show, uh, was actually the first type of Chinese porcelain before this type. Okay, this is the predecessor type. The only problem with this kind of porcelain, if you can call it a problem, is that the glaze that is put on it turns slightly pale blue during the firing. But it's a very beautiful color nonetheless, but it obscures the white porcelain body. Whereas later on in the Yuan, the glaze that covers the piece is transparent, clear, so that you can see the color of the actual body of the porcelain, which is pure white. Um, and also you can see the cobalt blue coming through uh, as deep blue. So the transparency of the glaze in the Yuan dynasty is a landmark kind of um, progress in the history of Chinese porcelains and the defining moment in the birth of blue and white porcelain. But what you have here, in the, also during the Yuan dynasty in the 14th century, is the use of this kind of decorative scheme that divides the uh, into horizontal registers, right? So if you look here at the bottom, can you see the lotus pe uh, lappets down here that actually are basically the same design here? I know it's a little hard to see from maybe where you are, but trust me, it's the same thing, same kind of thing. 
And then in the main register here, you have a dragon that is cavorting around the vase uh, amidst clouds. And then what do you see here? The same thing is happening. Uh, here we got a phoenix on top and something else over here. So there is a change in variation. But you can see how the decorative scheme actually owes part of its development to Qingbai porcelain in the Yuan dynasty. So it's a close connection between these two types of vessels and these two types of um, porcelain. Uh, here, maybe in this detail, you can see closely the dragon in the center and also the double line that separates one register from another. The double line is also present in the blue and white example. Uh, here, again, we can see the double line up here, double line here. Um, that kind of double line register also appears on this example of a stem cup uh, made during the, also in the 14th century, also in the Yuan, but a very different kind of shape, right? You're applying the same design motif uh, in, around an object, but the overall shape is completely different. Uh, here is the same piece shown from three sides, and this piece actually was excavated in Inner Mongolia, which is also a very far distance from the place where it was made. So you can see how blue and white travels uh, a large distance here uh, towards Mongolia in the north of China. Uh, the other two examples uh, in, the, in the exhibition are these two quite wonderful uh, examples of prunus vases. The shape is slightly different from this, right? The, the, the mouth is larger and the base is also not as narrow as the Yuan example. So these are Ming Dynasty um, examples of blue and white, but they also retain the idea of the breaking into registers horizontally. Now, in this case, the horizontal register has actually expanded in height and occupies the largest area uh, of the vase, if you are looking around. And what's been introduced now are figures in landscapes. Um, in this case, these were made for domestic uh, Chinese uh, clientele, uh, so the addition of figures is not a problem at all. Um, but what is interesting about this pair is that you can see the clouds on top here. There are this, kind of, this group of porcelain often has clouds, and you also see the drapery of the figures f all flowing in one direction, as though there was a big gust of wind that was blowing uh, at these people. So for this reason, these kinds of porcelain are called, the decoration is called the windswept style. Right, you, can, you can almost feel the wind. Wouldn't it be nice if we had that breeze right now? <laughs> so again, a very interesting development uh, from Yuan into Ming uh, in the Myers collection. Um, this piece is also on the left, uh, an, ex an example from the Myers collection in the exhibition. Uh, it's a different sh kind of vase form in Chinese called the Yuhu Chun. Uh, Yuhu Chun Ping means the Yuhu Chun type vase, uh, which is kind of like a bottle vase with a large kind of a belly, but a narrow neck and a flared mouth at the top. So it also actually comes out of a metalware shape um, in traditional uh, Persian pottery, uh, and actually in traditional Korean pottery, you also have this shape uh, made of metal. Uh, so here we can see the decoration is divided uh, into, again, several registers, right? The lotus lappets at the bottom, a large, uh, very decorative band, a major band in the middle, uh, more lotus lappets, and finally, sort of plantain or banana leaves here. And you can see how this decorative uh, scheme in the Myers collection is actually something that appears over and over again in other Yuan Dynasty examples of blue and white. This piece is in the British Museum, um, also from the, around the same period, but this piece was found in Indonesia in the 1960s. So it had been exported uh, probably not long after it was made to Southeast Asia. And the people there um, asked for different sorts of things. 
Um, this particular client wanted grape vines, and that's what he or she got up here. But you can see the idea uh, remains similar, right? The, the decorative scheme uh, is, is, can be changed and can be added to and can be expanded as and when needed. Um, an, an example from the um, St. Louis Art Museum. Um, this, again, is an early Ming example from the Yongle period uh, with that bracket rim, again, that is derived from Persian and Islamic metalwork um, with this sort of wave border uh, that is very beautiful. And again, floral scrolls uh, covering uh, the uh, inside of the dish. Um, I also wanted to contrast those uh, kinds of examples that appeal to the sort of Islamic or Western Southeast Asian markets against what is considered as native, domestic, and imperial taste. So this example um, is from the 15th century, the later part of the 15th century, from the, um, the Chenghua reign period. And this type of bowl is typically, typically called a palace bowl because many of them were used in the imperial palaces um, in large quantities. Um, the palace bowls are usually beautifully formed. Um, they are almost always perfectly round. If they're not perfect, they would have been thrown away and discarded, especially something that's intended for the palace has to be perfect. If it malforms during the, the um, firing process, if it collapses, if it you know, gets bent out of shape, it's thrown away and broken into a million pieces because they don't want that kind of thing floating into the market. So here is an example of a marked piece. The bottom says um, it's made in the, um, the Chenghua period of the great Ming dynasty. So here is a design of musk mallow, um, which is a plant, and beautifully kind of uh, sensitively painted, again by hand. So nothing in it is repetitive. Everything is, uh, you know, is, is very lively. So this is the kind of taste that the, the Chinese emperors wanted. It's very different from what the people um, in uh, Constantin uh, in Istanbul or people in Persia desire. It's a very different taste. The decoration has a lot of white in it. The blue is not overpowering. Um, and everything has a very balanced overall appeal. And this, of course, was a recent um, auction item. Uh, came from the collection of Lord Cunliffe uh, in England. And let's see, how much was the estimate? Is that a lot of money or what? <laughs> okay, so, so you can see that Chinese porcelain still has always had value. From the moment it was made and created in the 14th century in the Yuan Dynasty, it had high value. And that has not stopped in the 21st century. If you want to collect something that will appreciate drastically in value, Chinese, blue, and white. OK, so um, very quickly, we don't have much time left. Um, I just wanted to show you some pictures um, of the hatcher uh, cargo or the wreck, the shipwreck, out of which many pieces in the Myers collection uh, came from. Uh, in, I think, 1983, early 1983, um, Michael Hatcher, uh, who is this sort of Indiana Jones of the sea, um, you know, dug out and, and brought to the surface thousands and thousands of pieces of Chinese blue and white porcelain, as well as other kinds of Chinese porcelain. Uh, here you see um, the, uh, the, the ware being brought out. Um, the the collection, which was thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces, was all cleaned, restored, and brought to Amsterdam for um, auction. So what they did was actually very clever. In 1983, 
this kind of thing hadn't really happened, so it was a test case. So they threw in some of the Hatcher um, examples into this sale of the Van Gulik collection. Van Gulik was a well-known sinologist um, of China and Japan, and when he died, uh, his collection of art was auctioned. So they piggybacked a few of the Hatcher pieces into this sale to test the market, kind of as a trial, whether these things would sell or not. So the, the prices were very, were valued very you know, low at the time um, because they didn't want to overwhelm the market. So they chose a few pieces, not the best ones, and put very low values on it. And voila, they realized that there was a market for this stuff and people wanted to buy these things. So what happened was they had three more subsequent sales of the Hatcher collection in Amsterdam in 1983, uh, sorry, 1984, one in March, one in June, and then finally in 1985, the private collection of Hatcher himself. So he kept the best stuff for himself <laughs> until the very end when he saw what was, what was being fetched by those two earlier sales, he said, what the heck, let it go. <laughs> so that's how the, um, the Hatcher collection was dispersed at auction, and that's how Sam and Myrna Myers was able to acquire um, many of these pieces. Well, they were living in, in Paris at the time, not very far from Amsterdam, but you know, they probably had to spend days and days looking at these thousands of pieces to select what they thought or interesting and important examples. Clearly, you know, it, was, it wouldn't have been wise for them to buy you know, the very ordinary types of things because there are so many of them, so commonplace. You know, why would anyone want to buy a lot of the same kind of thing, right? So the Myers, in fact, were uh, here, sorry, uh, the, car, the Hatcher collection uh, cataloged by Colin Sheaf and Richard Kilburn in this catalog. So if you want to know all about the Hatcher, Cargo, read this book. Um, so what the Sam and Myrna Myers did was great. They selected some of the most unusual and interesting pieces from the Hatcher cargo. For example, the brush pot here with the beautifully painted um, sort of a snow scene. Uh, very, very, you know, mostly white. The painted portion is very delicate and, and small scale, so it doesn't overwhelm the viewer. And then this other piece of one of my favorite pieces of the show uh, is the wine pot in the form of a peach of longevity. I was actually surprised to see it in person today because when you think about, when you look at this picture, the catalog, you think it's gonna be like a round, round pot, right? But when I saw it in the gallery, I was very pleasantly surprised to find that actually it's a f quite a flattened kind of peach. So this is from the white side, but if you looked from the side of the spout or the handle, it's much more narrow. So it's a very interesting shape and this kind of tilted, um, uh, uh, what do you call this, the, the, the mouth at the top is also very lively. So you can see that in Chinese porcelain, you can have some very formal designs, but you can also have some whimsical designs. And I think that's what is really great about the Sam and, Myers, and Myrna Myers collection is that they were able to see through all of those very ordinary things and pick for their collection some of the most unusual and unique examples um, that you don't see anywhere else. And another of my favorite examples from the Myers collection is this vessel on the left, which is a kendi, um, a kind of um, vessel that's actually borrowed again from metalware and borrowed from Southeast Asia from a kind of uh, pouring vessel used by Islamic uh, communities. Um, but what I want to do here is to show you that, you know, as you are looking through shipwreck uh, porcelain, you can find very good examples like the, the Myers example, but you can also find very not good examples that are up for sale. For example, um, this um, one that are that is, uh, was shown in, um, in a Belgian auction not so long ago is of a, as you can see, I don't think you need to be uh, a rocket scientist to see that the one on the right is an inferior example of a shipwreck porcelain, right? Many times this is exactly what happens in shipwrecks is the glaze becomes, uh, the transparent glaze becomes completely degraded um, and then the, the blue 
uh, also it was probably not very good blue to begin with and got much worse um, you know, in its condition being submerged in seawater. So the Myers um, actually really did have a good eye and really focused on the finest examples of what came out of the sea. So kudos to the, the Myers. And finally, I just want to close tonight's talk to show you a, one of my favorite ex, uh, pieces in the show, too, is this uh, wonderful um, Chinese uh, gourd, double gourd vase, again, done in a very lively and unusual way um, that is atypical for Chinese porcelain. Um, it actually has a lot of Japanese textile influence in it, um, and it also contrasts well against this other uh, similar piece um, that's in the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach, Florida. So you can see the, the same idea of the double gourd is decorated in a very different way uh, by the potter. Um, there's, there are infinite examples and infinite ways of um, dealing with this beautiful material cobalt uh, on pure white porcelain, and the people that worked on it knew it. They exploited it to the full advantage um, and really uh, created things that can last forever. Um, blue and white porcelain, another why, reason why it's so valuable is because it's, the decoration is under the glaze. It will never fade away. Right? You can wash it, you can bake it, you can whatever. <laughs> you will still have the blue uh, ever after. So here's another example in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, contrasted with the Myers piece. Um, again, very rich. You can see that the, the blue, the cobalt in the Myers piece is, is a very, very, very deep and rich blue. So that's uh, an expensive cobalt piece. So finally, uh, that's all I have for you tonight. I hope um, you've enjoyed the lecture. I hope you enjoy the exhibition. And if you have some questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, there are mics that are being passed down. So if you raise your hand, I'll ask the mics to be passed to you. Gentleman in front. Hello. Uh, hello. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Can you clarify about the uh, the relationship between the early uh, uh, porcelain in China and the fritware designs? Uh, did the Chinese learn about the blue cobalt from the fritware and get the cobalt to start doing yes, their I, decorations, I, I, or did yes. fritware precede porcelain, or had they been making porcelain for centuries, just not decorated in blue? Uh, fritware has been around for a long time. You can find examples of fritware from the 11th, the 12th, the 13th centuries, whereas uh, the Chinese invented blue and white porcelain only in the 14th century. So underglazed blue and white porcelain. So we, we believe that they were inspired by what they knew the Persians were doing with the cobalt blue but they also realized that they had, the Chinese had a better material on which to apply the cobalt for it to appear more beautiful and be stronger and last for a much longer time. So I think they, they, they put two and two together. They said, you know, because the, the China had its, the wonderful kaolin, which is a perfectly white clay that allowed them to make the porcelain. That kind of clay was not available in Iran or Persia. So the Persians could never have made porcelain in the same way that the Chinese could. So once they realized they had the clay, then they, well, they, how do you decorate this clay in the best possible way? And they realized that cobalt was, had this magical property to it, that if you paint it on white porcelain, and if the glaze, um, the transparent glaze, has certain minerals in it, like uh, silica, alumina, some little iron, the transformation is phenomenal in the kiln. This beautiful blue porcelain comes out of it. Uh, well, the Chinese like red a lot too, but and they also try um, copper, copper red, on porcelain.
but copper red is a very unstable color to use on porcelain. The chances of um, copper red misfiring uh, is very great. So you have early you have some, I think, late Yuan, early Ming examples of, uh, co of copper red. Uh, very few perfect examples exist. There are some examples of copper red that turns out looking more like gray or brownish gray, kind of an icky color. So it, they realized that it was, you know, for a commercial enterprise where you're doing hundreds and thousands of pieces, you cannot afford that level of misadventure, right? So cobalt blue is a much more, uh, it's a sure, much, much surer thing than copper red. But they, they did try. <laughs> yes, uh, over here. How, how do you discriminate among extravagantly decorated pieces qualitatively? I mean, what would Hatcher keep versus what he would not keep? I mean, you said he was very discriminating. So yes. what um, are the qualitative differences? Well, when you're looking at Chinese porcelain in general, um, what you want to look for is, uh, there are several things, you know, like, like looking at a diamond, what are the qualities you look for? First of all, um, the overall condition is very important. Is the piece intact or is it broken? Right. If it's broken, the value immediately is almost nothing. If it's intact, you want to, well, you want to look at the shape. Is the shape a beautiful shape? Is the shape perfect from every angle, right? Or is it perfect on one angle, but if you look at it from the other side, it's slightly lopsided. Um, you want to look at the quality of the white. Is the porcelain itself very, very white, or is it kind of grayish in tone? You look at the blue, is the blue really deep and rich, or is it degraded and not rich? Um, you look at the decoration, is the decoration well painted, is it carefully painted, or is it painted with a slapdash hand? Um, so there are many aspects that you would want to consider when you're looking at any given piece. Um, so there's no perfect answer. But when you see something, when you see enough, and then you spot a piece that is really great, you should know it. <laughs> Lady in the back. Yes, so here again, you can see how the artists who painted this probably painted the outline of the waves first, and then he or she added the sort of concentric lines to it, and then another layer of more dilute cobalt was put kind of as a wash to create the lighter blue color. So you have different concentrations of cobalt. Actually, a little cobalt goes a long way. Uh, because it was a very expensive material. You didn't want to waste it by just you know, using too much. A little cobalt actually can produce a, a lot of blue. So if you want something that's super light blue, then you use almost a minute amount of it. Otherwise, it won't come out light. It will come out dark. Lady again in the back. You mentioned, can you hear me? You mentioned that the um, hatcher, that they would restore, and I understand our Maiping did not have the top. How do they restore it, and how would you know if you're looking at it? Uh, yes, uh, very oftentimes uh, things are missing, bits and parts of it. Um, and in this case, the, the mouth of the Maiping is a restoration. Um, so that was probably done afterwards. Um, you know, so that it could sell. Because if it didn't have uh, a mouth, it, again, this relates to the other question. If it's an incomplete object, its value uh, and its reason for existence is almost nil. So. Uh, I'm not sure if the Myers were the ones who did it or Hatcher had done it. Um, I have to compare the catalog. If I look at, I didn't go back to look at the Hatcher catalog, the sale catalog, to see whether the rim was there, the head was there or not. 
uh, he, they may have bought it without the restoration, or they may have bought it with the restoration already done for them. So the, I think a lot of the patcher pieces were cleaned, and some of them were probably restored so that they could go on the market. I think that is commonly done, um, so that things can, things can sell. But at least they were honest and told us about it, right? Although, you know, any good conservation scientist, an op objects conservation scientist, can immediately see that under blue light in a lab, the res restorations would immediately uh, fluoresce in a different way from the old body of the porcelain. So sooner or later, we would find out whether it was the original piece or not. Yes, any uh, gentleman in the last row in the back? Are there any records that are left which would tell us whether it was men or women who did the painting or a combination? Um, no, for ancient uh, records, we don't know uh, a whole lot. Nowadays, if you go to Jing De Jin, I think the larger portion of the people working are women uh, in the decoration part. But in the old days, um, I have a feeling it was primarily men. I'm not sure. Maybe Liz Hammer in the audience can answer that. <laughs> she doesn't know either. But I think it's probably men in the older days. Yes. Um, simply because this is actually very hard work. You know, you sit there all day and, you know, paint over and over and over again. You don't just paint one a day. You probably have to paint hundreds a day to make your living. It's not an easy job. And I also have to say that cobalt um, actually can be toxic as well. And so many of these people who work directly with the material had short lives because they were breathing and touching this material that was not good for their health. One more question, the lady at the back. Can you tell if everyone was right-handed who painted these or, I mean, I'm an artist, I um, can tell. Well, the only thing I can say is that in traditional Chinese culture, left-handedness was frowned upon. So it's not likely. And one of the reasons for that is the way the Chinese script is written. It's very much um, written in a way that is predisposed to a right-hander. So for a left-hander to write calligraphy is very difficult and almost never very aesthetic. So for that reason, we all believe it was probably a right-handed mostly. Okay, well, thank you very much for all your interest, questions. <laughs>